Chapter 5 How Dorothy Became a Princess When the people of the Emerald City heard that Dorothy had returned to them, everyone was eager to see her, for the little girl was a general favorite in the Land of Oz. From time to time, some of the folk from the great outside world had found their way into this fairyland, but all except one had been companions of Dorothy and had turned out to be very agreeable people. The exception I speak of was the wonderful Wizard of Oz, a sleight-of-hand performer from Omaha who went up in a balloon and was carried by a current of air to the Emerald City. His queer and puzzling tricks made the people of Oz believe him a great wizard for a time, and he ruled over them until Dorothy arrived on her first visit and showed the wizard to be a mere humbug. He was gentle and a kindly-hearted little man, and Dorothy grew to like him afterward. When, after an absence, the wizard returned to the land of Oz, Ozma received him graciously and gave him a home in a part of the palace. In addition to the wizard, two other personages from the outside world had been allowed to make their home in the Emerald City. The first was the quaint Shaggy Man, whom Ozma had made governor of the royal storehouses, and the second a yellow hen named Billina, who had a fine house in the gardens back of the palace, where she looked after a large family. Both of these had been old comrades of Dorothy, so you see the little girl was quite an important personage in Oz, and the people thought she had brought them good luck and loved her next best to Ozma. During her several visits, this little girl had been the means of destroying two wicked witches who oppressed the people, and she had discovered a live scarecrow who was now one of the most popular personages in all the fairy country. With the Scarecrow's help, she had rescued Nick Chopper, a tin woodman, who had rusted in a lonely forest, and the tin man was now the emperor of the country of the Winkies, and much beloved because of his kind heart. No wonder the people thought Dorothy brought them good luck. Yet, strange as it may seem, she had accomplished all these wonders, not because she was a fairy or had any magical powers whatever, but because she was a simple, sweet, and true little girl who was honest to herself and to all whom she met. In this world in which we live, simplicity and kindness are the only magic wands that work wonders. And in the land of Oz, Dorothy found these same qualities had won for her the love and admiration of the people. Indeed, the little girl had made many warm friends in the fairy country, and the only real grief the Ozites had ever experienced was when Dorothy left them and returned to her Kansas home. Now she received a joyful welcome, although no one except Ozma knew at first that she had finally come to stay for good and all. That evening, Dorothy had many callers, and among them were such important people as TikTok a machine man who thought and spoke and moved by clockwork, her old companion, the genial Shaggy Man, Jack Pumpkinhead, whose body was brushwood and whose head was a ripe pumpkin with a face carved upon it, the Cowardly Lion and the Hungry Tiger, two great beasts from the forest who served Princess Ozma, and Professor H. M. Wogglebug, T.E. This Wogglebug was a remarkable creature, he had once been a tiny little bug crawling around in the schoolroom, but he was discovered and highly magnified so that he could be seen more plainly, and while in this magnified condition, he had escaped. He had always remained big, and he dressed like a dandy and was so full of knowledge and information, which are distinct acquirements, that he had been made a professor and the head of the royal college. Dorothy had a nice visit with these old friends and also talked a long while with the wizard who was little and old and withered and dried up, but as merry and active as a child. Afterward, she went to see Belina's fast-growing family of chicks. Toto, Dorothy's little black dog, also met with a cordial reception. Toto was especially fond of the shaggy man, and he knew everyone else. Being the only dog in the Land of Oz, he was highly respected by the people, who believed animals entitled to every consideration if they believe, behaved themselves properly. Dorothy had four lovely rooms in the palace, which were always reserved for her, and were called Dorothy's rooms. 
These consisted of a beautiful sitting room, a dressing room, a dainty bed chamber, and a big marble bathroom. And in these rooms were everything that heart could desire, placed there with loving thoughtfulness by Ozma for her little friend's use. The royal dressmakers had the little girl's measures, so they kept the closets in her dressing room filled with lovely dresses of every description and suitable for every occasion. No wonder Dorothy had refrained from bringing with her her old calico and gingham dresses. Here, everything that was dear to a little girl's heart was supplied in profusion, and nothing so rich and beautiful could ever have been found in the biggest department stores in America. Of course, Dorothy enjoyed all these luxuries, and the only reason she had heretofore preferred to live in Kansas was because her aunt and uncle loved her and needed her with them. Now, however, all was to be changed, and Dorothy was really more delighted to know that her dear relatives were to share in her good fortune and enjoy the delights of the Land of Oz than she was to possess such luxury for herself. Next morning, at Ozma's request, Dorothy dressed herself in a pretty sky-blue gown of rich silk trimmed with real pearls. The buckles of her shoes were set with pearls, too, and more of these priceless gems were on a lovely coronet which she wore upon her forehead. For, said her friend Ozma, from this time forth, my dear, you must assume your rightful rank as a princess of Oz, and being my chosen companion, you must dress in a way befitting the dignity of your position. Dorothy agreed to this, although she knew neither gowns nor jewels could make her anything else than the simple, unaffected little girl she had always been. As soon as they had breakfasted, the girls eating together in Ozma's pretty boudoir, the ruler of Oz said, Now, dear friend, we will use the magic belt to transport your uncle and aunt from Kansas to the Emerald City. But I think it would be fitting in receiving such distinguished guests for us to sit in my throne room. Oh, they're not very distinguished, Ozma, said Dorothy. They're just plain people like me. Being your friends and relatives, Princess Dorothy, they are certainly distinguished, replied the ruler with a smile. Then they won't hardly know what to make of all your splendid furniture and things, protested Dorothy gravely. It may scare him to see your grand throne room. And perhaps we better go into the backyard, Ozma, where the cabbages grow and the chickens are playing. Then it would seem more natural to Uncle Henry and Aunt Em. No, they shall first see me in my throne room, replied Ozma decidedly. And when she spoke in that tone, Dorothy knew it was not wise to oppose her, for Ozma was accustomed to having her own way. So together they went to the throne room, an immense domed chamber in the center of the palace. Here stood the royal throne, made of solid gold and encrusted with enough precious stones to stock a dozen jewelry stores in our country. Ozma, who was wearing the magic belt, seated herself in the throne, and Dorothy sat at her feet. In the room were assembled many ladies and gentlemen of the court, clothed in rich apparel and wearing fine jewelry. Two immense animals squatted, one on each side of the throne, the cowardly lion and the hungry tiger. In a balcony high up in the dome, an orchestra played sweet music, and beneath the dome, two electric fountains sent sprays of colored perfumed water shooting up nearly as high as the arched ceiling. Are you ready, Dorothy? asked the ruler. I am, replied Dorothy, but I don't know whether Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are ready. That won't matter, declared Ozma. The old life can have very little to interest them, and the sooner they begin the new life here, the happier they will be. Here they come, my dear. As she spoke, there before the throne appeared Uncle Henry and Aunt Em, who for a moment stood motionless, glaring with white and startled faces at the scene which confronted them. If the ladies and gentlemen present had not been so polite, I am sure they would have laughed at the two strangers. Aunt Em had her calico dress skirt tucked up, and she wore a faded blue checked apron. Her hair was rather straggly, and she had on a pair of Uncle Henry's old slippers. In one hand, she held a dish towel, and in the other, a cracked earthenware plate, which she had 
been engaged in wiping when so suddenly transported to the land of Oz. Uncle Henry, when the summons came, had been out in the barn doing chores. He wore a ragged and much soiled straw hat, a checked shirt without any collar, and blue overalls tucked into the tops of his old cowhide boots. By gum, gasped Uncle Henry, looking around as if bewildered. Well, I swan, gurgled Aunt Em in a hoarse, frightened tone. Then her eyes fell upon Dorothy, and she said, don't don't that look like our little girl, our Dorothy, Henry? Hi there, look out, Em, exclaimed the old man as Aunt Em advanced a step. Take care of the wild beasties or you're a goner. But now Dorothy sprang forward and embraced and kissed her aunt and uncle affectionately, afterward taking her hands in their own. Don't be afraid, she said to them. You're now in the land of Oz, where you are to live always and be comfortable and happy. You'll never have to worry over anything again, because there won't be anything to worry about. And you owe it all to the kindness of my friend, Princess Ozma. Here she led them before the throne and continued, Your Highness, this is Uncle Henry, and this is Aunt Em. They want to thank you for bringing them here from Kansas. Aunt Em tried to slick her hair, and she hid the dish towel and dish under her apron while she bowed to the lovely Ozma. Uncle Henry took off his straw hat and held it awkwardly in his hands. But the ruler of Oz rose and came from her throne to greet her newly arrived guests, and she smiled as sweetly upon them as if they had been a king and a queen. "'You are very welcome here, where I have brought you for Princess Dorothy's sake,' she said graciously." and I hope you will be quite happy in your new home. Then she turned to her courtiers, who were silently and gravely regarding the scene, and added, I present to my people our Princess Dorothy's beloved Uncle Henry and Aunt Em, who will hereafter be subjects of our kingdom. It will please me to have you show them every kindness and honor in your power, and to join me in making them happy and contented. Hearing this, all those assembled bowed low and respectfully to the old farmer and his wife, who bobbed their own heads in return. And now, said Dorothy to them, Dorothy will show you the rooms prepared for you. I hope you will like them, and shall expect you to join me at luncheon. So Dorothy led her relatives away, and as soon as they were out of the throne room and alone in the corridor, Aunt Em squeezed Dorothy's hand and said, Child, child! How in the world did we ever get here so quick? And is it all real? And are we to stay here, as she says? And what does it all mean, anyhow? Dorothy laughed. Why didn't you tell us what you were going to do? Inquired Uncle Henry reproachfully. If I'd known about it, I'd have put on my Sunday clothes. I'll explain everything as soon as we get to your rooms, promised Dorothy. You're in great luck, Uncle Henry and Aunt Em, and so am I. And oh, I'm just so happy to see you here at last. As he walked by the little girl's side, Uncle Henry stroked his whiskers thoughtfully. Pears to me, Dorothy, we won't make bang-up fairies, he remarked. And my back hair looks like a fright, wailed Aunt Em. Never mind, returned the little girl reassuringly. You won't have anything to do now but look pretty, Aunt Em. And Uncle Henry won't have to work till his back aches, that's certain. Sure, they asked wonderingly and in the same breath. Course I'm sure, said Dorothy. You're in the fairyland of Oz now, and what's more, you belong to it.